Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Anexina Infrastructure Modernization Podcast on Women in Technology. This episode will be discussing intergenerational technology and working in IT. Um, today we've got a roundtable of women across the spectrum of a couple different generations. So my name is Brenda Heisler. I am a resource coordinator here at Anexinet. I'm representing the mid-20s. Let's just go around the table and introduce ourselves. What age bracket we're going, coming from, what is our current uh, career background, and maybe a little bit of how you got to where you currently are. Okay, hi, I'll start since I'm the elder. <laughs> um, Pat McGlinchey with the Old Packard Enterprise, and I'm in the 60s category. Um, 35 years with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. i am always worked in the channel, first in support, and then as a partner manager um, for the last 20-some years. How did I get here? Um, I was hired in a technology role because my background was communications, and they felt that folks with strong communications ability could communicate about IT to non-technical people. Patty Wynn, I'm the partner event manager at Anexinet. I have been here for 18 years. Prior to that, I worked at a private equity firm for seven years, and prior to that, I was in healthcare for 12 years. I uh, actually came here because uh, someone at the private equity firm that I work for started Anexinet and asked me to join him. So Heather Pollack, I work at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I've been doing sales for 16 years and technology sales probably for about 12. So I wanted to do pharmaceutical sales and Johnson Johnson said you have to get some experience. So I worked at Pitney Bowes and then from Pitney Bowes wanted to make a change in, in career and wanted to get into technology sales instead. Representing the... Uh, the 40s, I guess. <laughs> not, the not quite 40s. <laughs> uh, my name is Victoria Fagan. I'm the marketing manager at Anexinet. I work uh, closely with Patty here for three years. He started out as a marketing coordinator and um, previously worked at a clinical trial recruiting company doing um, their marketing and there was an open position and Patty let me know and here I am and <laughs> yeah, and I'll be representing the 30s. As stated before, I'm Brenda. I will be representing the mid-20s, or better known as the youths, and let's just jump into it. All right, so we've got a little bit of your education and career background um, and kind of how you got to where you currently are. Let's start with what about the technical field really got you into or what drew you to the technical field? That's probably a better way to put it. I was interested because it was not something I'd ever considered. This Now remember, this was 1978. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, they were looking to hire people with strong communication skills because they found that technical people were very good at what they did, but they couldn't communicate it to anyone else. So that just appealed to me, and it had never been something I'd thought about while I was in school. Okay, so it was more of a opportunity where the opportunity was right and if you think 1978 program? the computer industry was where it was mm -hmm. I mean, it was really happening and it was new and it was different and there were more opportunities actually better pay and um, opportunity for travel so it all appealed to me okay and I guess I came in from an EMC background so they were looking for you know I mean I guess in 2006 virtualization was a big play and they were looking for just more feet on the streets, more salespeople. So they weren't looking for people with technical backgrounds as much as people with sales backgrounds. They feel, felt they could teach technology, but you can't teach sales. So that's kind of how I came into the tech world. For me, again, I was invited by um, John Hopkins, who was one of the founders of our company uh, back in early, I guess, 2001. And 
I w really had never worked in technology, but what they were looking for, again, wasn't someone who knew technology, but someone who was good with people. Mm -hmm. I have a capability of really connecting with a lot of people, and you know, if I'm not able to help them, I'm very resourceful to be able to get people the help that they need and, and get things done. So it wasn't necessarily technology that drew me there. It was the opportunity to be part of a growing company. So I have a question for you, Pat. Like, how many women were, I guess, did you know in that tech space, like working in the tech space when you first started, and was that intimidating, like the lack of women? Well, actually, the first job was with Digital Equipment Corporation. I mentioned I was with Hewlett Packard Enterprise for 35 years, but the trajectory was Digital Equipment Corporation, which was bought by Compaq, Compaq bought by HP. Digital Equipment Corporation, I would tell you the sales force was half and half, male and female. They were very strong at their hiring of women. Wow. And they became very successful. They figured mm -hmm. out that it was a it was a model that worked. Mm. So I will tell you that as the years have gone on, just more in the HP world is where I'm sitting in meetings and I'm the only woman. Oh. That the male That's population is higher at HP versus when I started much earlier at Digital Equipment Corporation. I would yeah. have expected exactly. it to be reversed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, so... Um, I'm on another podcast with an ex-net called Buffer Overflow, and we actually did an episode on the history of women and their in involvement with the tech industry, computers specifically. And actually, the um, back in the 70s, it used to be very close to mm -hmm. half and half. Mm -hmm. It's just been recently as uh, marketing, uh, video games are part of it, and just like early on, that this stigma has kind of popped up where technology is more has more been pushed to the male side as it's become basically as it's become more of an established science and a more of an accepted industry it's become more male centric so that actually matches from mm -hmm. what historical data says despite what you might think yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and when i started at in 2006 at EMC i was one of only you know the only female in the sales team of yeah. 15 to 20 guys so and what was that like for you uh, i could be intimidating that yeah. <laughs> can be so you got to just kind of roll with the punches as it as it is then but i would say at hp it's much more female and even within the past five years i would say there's been such a dramatic shift of so many more women at the conferences at the events doing things now that i didn't see even 10 years ago Right, and a stronger female population at the resellers, where we call it, like an exonet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the workforce. I mean, right. I think there's just so many more women in the workforce that now, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of a necessity mm -hmm. for a lot of people to have two people working um, that wasn't really there even, like I said, 10 years ago. Yeah, and I, I would make an argument also with the way that the um, – industry is changing or the the I guess how various industries are doing like if you look at the tech industry there's a lot of opportunity especially in this area there's a negative employment unemployment rate so there's a lot of opportunity for people who are um, I've from a lot of the women that I've been talking to like at an exnet like this wasn't their first job mm -hmm. especially if they're a consultant this isn't their first job it's like they came to it because their current the job that they started in was no longer viable so then they had to re-educate themselves and come into the this sphere that has more opportunity as uh pat you mentioned like the you know we have different skills and different genders do tend like women tend to be better at multitasking at that like human connection uh kind of thing that more soft side of technology, I guess, mm -hmm. the stuff that needs to happen around the technology in order to make it work smoothly. So having a higher level of, or a more equal distribution does tend to lead more towards smooth and more of a well-rounded functioning environment. And back yeah. to Heather's comment about being intimidated in a room full of men. Mm -hmm. I would say that at a certain age it is. I will tell you now that age has a benefit. Um, now I believe that the men are intimidated when I'm in the room. And it's because I'm older and of my and my background. And it's not that they think I'm their mother or their aunt, but there is a certain amount of respect that 
just changes the feel in the room. Yeah, because you, you have that experience right. to back you up, right? right. All right. I also recently read an article that said the, the best thing for a woman in her 50s in the workplace is to team up with a millennial. So, <laughs> And it did. And basically what it said is that you're going to learn so many new things from, from him or her and then um, – and vice versa, because there's, you know, all these new technologies and new little things that being in the workplace now for a lot of years, <laughs> um, I, there are new things that I'm not aware of. And it's like teaching an old dog a new trick mm -hmm. and being able to get better. And even, you know, when you, it's, you know, self-assessment time every year, I'm doing the same thing. It's like I want to learn new technologies to work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. And that helps with, you know, balancing your work life with your, your home life, because at this point, I'm not going home to children and, you know, dealing with homework, but I still want to be able to do other things. And if I'm taking longer to get my daily job done, and there's all these little tricks that you can do to, to make it go faster, you know, kudos to Tori on my team, as well as Ina on the marketing team at Anaxinet, because we complement each other. There are mm -hmm. things that I know that I, I help the, the ladies with, and there's definitely things on a daily basis that they're helping me with. And it definitely complements each other when you have the intergeneration, whether it's men or women. In, in my case, it's women that I'm dealing with in the marketing department, but it's it goes really well. And you, you need a little piece of everything. So, Patty, you mentioned uh, the work-life balance. You focused a lot on this, or you, you had something that you wanted to say on work-life balance. Yeah, probably because I addressed this earlier than anyone else in this room, mm -hmm. um, back at a time when it was, I would say, much more difficult than it is today. Mm. Um, and what I've noticed is, it's not a challenge today. My daughters are uh, 28 today, one and the other is 30. But back when they were young, and it was even before um, we went to home offices, so went to an office every day. It was really a challenge. And what was the challenge was that you could not bring your home issues into the office because then it gave the appearance that you were distracted or you were weak or you weren't committed. And what I have found through the years is, as I work with men primarily mm -hmm. and more of their wives, as Heather mentioned, have gone back to the workplace, they openly bring in their home issues. Mm -hmm to meetings and leave meetings early to go places. And it's now become more acceptable to talk about that. But back, you could not, because it could have been damaging to your career back in the 70s and early 80s if you brought in any family issues. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays it's gone much better, and it's because more of the men are experiencing it. Okay. And that's very different. So it's actually helped us be able to um, talk about work-life balance issues in the workplace. Okay. So, like, as the men have taken on a more active role in the actual, like... Parenting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Parenting, family, life, that makes it more acceptable. For... Right. But all I do think women are much better at it, and I just think mm -hmm. it's back to that we are, <laughs> we multitask much better. And I mm -hmm. think being a working mother is all about multitasking. And then my other question is... Would this be a question if this was a room full of men? Mm. Probably now because, like I said, now it's completely different. Right. I mean, my husband, we were 50-50 on everything. I mean, the cooking, the cleaning, who's dropping off. Right. You know, we're making, <clears throat> you know, those type uh, – we're all making sacrifices. But mm -hmm. with those sacrifices, like I know you've mentioned – you know, your kids at three months were in daycare, dropped off at 8 a.m., picked up at 5. Like, with having two incomes now, we're able to have a nanny for the first couple months and keep them home. And, you know, so there's benefits to having two working parents and to have that um, balance. But there, it's also challenging because you are – everyone is always multitasking mm -hmm. and everyone is – responsible for everything so it's it's different than when women would take care of the things at home and the men would make money and work you knew what your jobs were whereas now every job is everyone's job would you say like part of that is the economic necessity like ha the fact that now if a, it's not nearly as common that someone a man can go uh, have a full-time job and support his entire family I don't think it's just work related. I think that it's also just 
the way the world is now, women don't want to just be that stay at home person. Right. And, Absolutely. you know, like before, like you stuck out marriage too, whether you were happy or not, people stayed together. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, people don't want to stay home, be that stay at home mom. And then come 20 years later, your husband's not interested in you anymore. And you, you have nothing to fall back on. Mm -hmm. So I think that women are more um, self-aware and they, they want to be able to take care of themselves and be self-sufficient and, and be an equal. And sometimes I think when, unfortunately, when women stay home, which I think is the hardest job to stay home, take care of children and the home and be that one oh, key absolutely. person. It's, it's a, it's it's a full-time like job. Of, right. It is a full-time job, and sometimes it's a thankless job. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, like, you know, you have these wonderful children and, you know, that that's great, but you can also work and have wonderful children. Mm -hmm. Pat is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. She has two great kids. And I, I also, you know, unfortunately divorced when my mm -hmm. daughter was five years old. But, you know, she's a successful business owner. And I think mm -hmm. that part of that is because, you know, I didn't quit because I didn't have my husband anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I went and I got a job and I made sure that, you know, we were going on vacations and we had a nice home. And, you know, we had good family values and, mm -hmm. you know, and co-parent it with my ex-husband as well and, you know, and a stepmother that was involved. So I think that just the home dynamics has also rolled into the into the office similar mm -hmm. to what Heather was saying. The expectations are just different at home as well as in the office. And I never once even considered being a stay-at-home mom. Like, I had a career before I had a family. Mm -hmm. So Same here. the career, now it's just balancing and, and managing both. Whereas before you could spend so much time. And I think this is a testament to having multi-generations in the workforce. Because in my 20s, I had all the time in the world to focus on my career. And now it's all that experience, but there's limitations to the hours. Whereas, mm -hmm. like you were saying, now in your 50s and your 60s, those limitations are, are less. Uh, do you think uh, flexibility in the workforce, um, being able to like work from home and the technology to do it has also assisted the, the work-life balance? I kind of always had that. So I didn't always have it, and I did notice the difference. It was a 1995 Compaq at the time closed all of their offices and sent anyone in a sales position home. And it did take me a few months to get used to it because I had always had a break. There was work and there was home. And, but at some point, it was the best solution ever. I used to say that I would have all my machines going at one time. I would have my computer, my washer, my dryer, my fax. I could, have <laughs> I could fold laundry during a conference call. Yeah, faxes back in the day. I could be in a parking lot of the elementary school heading into the Halloween party and closing a million-dollar deal mm -hmm. and get off the phone and walk in and make little decorations. So I think that, but I do believe that it requires discipline which not everybody has. So you have to have the discipline to be able to do everything in the, the amount of time that you're given. And I would, I would almost argue that now it's kind of become a double-edged sword. Because mm -hmm. if you can have your email on your phone, mm -hmm. great, okay, you can work from home. You can, like, for me, I'm getting some remodeling done on my house. Like, I can have the contractor come in and, like, be there during the day while they're there, but still get my work done, which is great. But also at night, you know, I can have slack on my phone I can have email on my phone I'm never really like out of touch unless I specifically put that barrier down what have you done in order to kind of negate or blunt that other edge throughout your life I would kind of answer that back to you guys because your experience has been it's always mm -hmm. been there yeah you know I mean whereas I'm even kind of hugging between the two generations like it was really around college that I got my computer. So I had a life without that. Mm -hmm. Whereas for you guys, it's, it's, it's probably more difficult to turn it off. Well, so I didn't get a smartphone until college, but you know, even still I had a phone and it's kind of become like the default is that you're connected to everything. So it's like, you have to make a conscious choice to shut off. Like I had shut off notifications from your email, uh, on your phone so that when you're out, you can actually like be mentally where you need to be, you know? I had an experience though, when I went out for my second child for, I was out for four months on maternity leave mm -hmm. and I discussed it with the person who was gonna cover me, all of these, which I thought were very urgent issues that needed to be dealt with. 
Well, he didn't deal with any of them while I was out for four months, and nobody died. It was all fine when I came back, and that taught me a lesson that you can shut it off, mm -hmm. and people will just go on, and they'll just either wait for you to get back to it. But it made me realize that you don't always have to be addressing everything as an urgent matter. When I'm not working in the ER. Right. Right. For me, I pretty much once I leave the office, I will not check my email. Maybe right before I go to bed, I'll clean out any spam. And then if, if anything came in from like senior management, which rarely happens, I just feel like I have a clean slate the next day if mm -hmm. I go through and delete all the junk mail. The first thing in the morning, I'll take a glance at it. But I will say Friday afternoon, three o'clock, I'm pretty much finishing up what I need to finish up for the week and everything else can wait till Sunday night when I check my email. So I'm really good about disconnecting on the weekend. In the evening during the week, I, I do like to check just in case something's going to affect my next morning. Right. Even, you know, for our podcast today, you know, our, our other host w was sick and reaches out to me last night. I wouldn't put hours into it, you know, getting back to anybody, but anything that I felt was urgent that needed to be attended to, I do like to try to check between 8 and 9 o'clock in case anything's going on. See, I have working mom guilt, so I'm on all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, as you know, like you say, kind of straddling the, the different generations because I know that, you know, my lunch hour, I'm, I might be picking up someone or doing something. I'm working at... 5 36 in the morning i'm working at 7 30 8 o'clock at night because the nine to five although you try to protect those hours you know that you're with your family mm -hmm. it's the hours before and it's the hours mm -hmm. after that you do kind of work so you do feel challenged to uh shut it off so we've talked about kind of the how the flexibility um uh, kind of helps with it helps and or hinders this work-life balance uh, how has it affected your day to day? Like, what does a general work day look like? How is that? Um, has the new technology kind of affected your day to day life? Well, I think Heather referenced it. So, same thing, mm -hmm. between five and seven in the morning, checking on emails. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in the car between appointments, you're on con calls because you're using your time efficiently mm -hmm. to get other meetings done in another method. Then you're, in my case, it's visiting resellers during the day, but also even sometimes when I'm at the resellers, close your ears. I may be on the phone with another reseller because I've got to get everything done for the portfolio I cover. But it's, I mean, I believe technology, I couldn't get everything done without the technology. 100% right? it, agree. It, it absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit stressful, mm -hmm. but it really helps you get everything done that you need to get done, and you're um, and, and in the time frame that you can. Like I said, I mean, I know Heather does this. When we're in the car driving from one appointment to another, we're knocking out a bunch of con calls. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I actually probably talk to Pat two or three days a week, mm -hmm. catching up, c driving into the office. So when I get to the office, I can do something she needs, you know, or vice versa. If we're waiting for something, I'll use that time to catch up on, you know, an email or, you know, I haven't heard from this. Did you send this? I received this. What's the next step? So I also use drive time. Um, unfortunately, my commute is about an hour and 15 minutes oh, each way every day. So yep. I'm two and a half hours in the car and I'm usually knocking out, you know, trying to catch up with someone in the office, one of our partners. Oh my goodness, I might call my mother. You know, yeah. catch up with her. <laughs> no, I'm I'm with you on that. I, I have a fifty minute drive right now. But I'm the same way, like if I have a morning call, usually I'll use that as my driving in time mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um so as sales reps it, it allows you to be mobile. Yes. For my and I think it's one of the first words my kids learned. Mm. Con call. They used to call it con call. <laughs> <laughs> because they'd get in the car and they'd be like, Shh, mommy's on a com call. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, Patty and Tori, how about you guys? I think it's good knowing that you have the flexibility. Um, with our roles, we work very closely with the sales teams and our partners, and it's not always a scheduled call, scheduled meeting, mm -hmm. um, but people rely on us to, to be here and to help them with different things that come up during the day, which it's actually, in our, our roles, I think it's easier still to be in the office most of the time, mm -hmm. but um, I do enjoy the flexibility of having that option. The weather's bad. It's going to take me two or 
three hours that I can just, you know, simply call. Or in most cases, I'll get a text in the morning, stay home, Patty, work from home. If you need anything, let me know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it is, especially, you know, coming from healthcare and private equity companies, like where I didn't have that flexibility at all. You know, working at a hospital, you did a timesheet, and if you were 15 minutes late, it was point. To five off your vacation time, like oh, I mean, wow. down to like down to the minute. So, yeah. you know, to have that flexibility at an exonet, it's great. I wish I had it when I was raising my daughter; it would have been better. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, it, and even you know, if you're running late one day, that just having the flexibility to stay a little late. Mm -hmm. Back in the '80s and '90s, that that was so frowned upon. Like I you think... wouldn't come into work late, and you wouldn't come to work, uh, leave work early. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, without it being very disruptive. Mm -hmm. And now, like, you know, as long as you're getting your work done and you're meeting your deadlines. I would agree. I would, I've seen such a change. Just like dress code has relaxed, mm -hmm. so have the understanding of the fact that we have another life outside of work. Because I call in a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. I think it's prevalent that it's much more flexible than when I started in this industry. So much, but I don't know that I like that. I, I like a Friday dress down day and anybody who sees me in the office, I'm still coming to work pretty much dressed to work. Uh, <laughs> you weren't, you, not the suits in the 80s with the fluffy blouses. Though. I did That's have right. a suit in the <laughs> 80s with a fluffy blouse. <laughs> Didn't we all? <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, Patty. So for my role as resource coordinator, I, I, um, I touch a lot of different areas of the company just because I'm, juggling a lot of the like day-to-day -day, keep the department running kind of stuff so like finance marketing uh, sales pre-sales all that and like I find that it's a lot easier when there are people who are physically here if I have a question you know I can email someone or call them as much as I want if they have if it's not high on their priority list I'm, it's not going to get done but if I can like just swing by their office in person, just knock on the door, ask for five minutes or something that I can get so much more done in person than I can through technology. And my other thing is if I plan a day at home, it's so much better because mm -hmm. I have these five yep. things I need to get done. I have three conference calls. I have a training I need to take, you know, or I need some quiet time to work on something. Then I love a day home and I'll plan a day home. But yeah. and I, now, I was going to say, I, I see I've seen kind of two different structures. Like in my 20s, we had to be in the office. It was 8 to 5. That was the expectation. Mm -hmm. And now it's – I have a number that I have to hit. Mm -hmm. And how I get to that number depends on how I spend my time. I will say with being a working mom and having a, a limited amount of time, I'm incredibly more efficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you only have these hours, you have to get so much more done. Mm -hmm. And I just – you know, there's no water cooler talk. Like, yeah, you don't right. have time for that. You have specific tasks in a limited amount of time that you increase your efficiency dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why so many people are multitasking. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are on a con call, on your computer, checking your email, getting your Christmas stuff done, mm -hmm. doing, <laughs> you know, closing deals yeah. and making sure, you know, there's – Milk in the fridge. I mean, yeah. and that's all happening because you're doing Peapod and you're doing <laughs> Amazon and you're, you know, doing Salesforce and you're doing everything else. So it's just, it, you have to be more efficient if you're working in that balance. It's like their employers are less concerned about making sure you're in a specific place and more concerned that you're actually doing what mm -hmm. they're paying you mm -hmm. to do. Absolutely. So like, mm -hmm. so like the personal accountability has kind of shifted back onto yourself right. so like it's up to you to make sure that you're doing that yep just to pivot a little bit going back to when you all first started at your job um are were there any mentors that kind of jumped out at you or that really helped you i my favorite song is jackson brown for a dancer because it says you learn the steps from everyone you meet and in the end you do one dance alone and i think that is life I think everyone I've met, male or female, mm -hmm. in this industry, A, had something to offer, even though some people are more difficult than others, but you can mm -hmm. find it eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and what you do is you, you identify it and you adopt it into your style if it works. I would call, do a shout-out since we're at an exonet that one of my mentors is John Calamago. Mm -hmm. um, his style, the way he addresses situations – 
even antagonistic situations has been something that I've been able to learn from. Um, there's nothing more enjoyable than sitting back and watching John have a conversation with someone because the way he navigates it is something that I like to take away and say, oh, I can do that mm -hmm. as well. So my mentors have not primarily been women, and although there are a few women, mm -hmm. obviously, that I've taken things from, but I would say that it's equal. It's men and women that have um, helped me uh, develop what became my style. I would agree 100% with that, and same kudos to John Colomago. <laughs> I remember he took me to the first meeting, and um, I'd never been in technology before, and he's like, do you have any questions? I'm like, oh, stuff. well, what's HP, SWD, BCS, <laughs> MDF? Like, they use all of these acronyms that you feel like you're listening to a foreign language. And, oh, yeah. And he was like, oh, okay, let's, you know, I, I didn't even realize that and sat down. And also, I would like to give a, a little kudos to Pat McGlinchey, who has mm -hmm. somewhat mentored me in the technology field and helped me navigate not only, you know, the HP and Accident relationship, but taught me, like, um, some interactive skills and assertiveness skills that I don't think that I possessed until I really engaged with Pat yeah. over the past five to you eight years. You were a years. lot shyer back then. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and I use that, you know, even like with our executive management and it, and I mean, luckily we work at a company that I feel like is an open door policy, oh, you know, or you can walk mm. right into our CEO's office and, you know, shoot the wind or, you know, what I like, you know, mm -hmm. just say hi. And he's welcoming that. And he wants that. And, you know, down to, you know, our guy who collects trash at the end of the day, you know, mm -hmm. so I think being able to communicate with everybody and treat everybody equally with respect is something that Pat and I both and, and every lady in the, the, this room shares. I said, but it takes like a, a little bit of that oomph to, you know, wipe away that top, that that title and whether it's a man or woman mm -hmm. if you're a CEO or if you're a CTO or if you're a director you're a secretary to treat everybody with respect and not allow that to intimidate you mm -hmm. I know we've spoken about you know is it intimidating walking into a room full of men mm -hmm. just you know or if you have an idea you know to to be able to to speak your mind and not you know well you know what I'm only a manager here I really shouldn't say that mm -hmm. And I would add to that that HPE has a formal mentorship program. Oh, okay. And due to the fact that I'm the one in the 60s here, um, I tend to be the person that is always being assigned mm. folks. Pat, how do, I, how do I sign up for that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll mentor you later at lunch. <laughs> yeah, I will say one of the – so as – you know, I, I started here straight out of college, and in my role – it's like I don't necessarily have authority. I don't necessarily fit within the simple, like, the, the ladder. Chain of I command. Guess. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, the chain of command. But still, like, I have stuff that I need to get done. And in order for that to get done, I need to work with other people. I need things from other people. So it was a huge thing for me. Like, I did have a couple female role models. So, like, when I first started, uh, Kendall Blake, she's currently director awesome. of operations. Mm -hmm. um, I took over her job when I came here. And just, like, watching her, and then uh, it was a combination of her and uh, Sarah Young, who was a project mm -hmm. manager mm -hmm. when I came here. Uh, she used to be a lawyer who worked in family court, so she definitely had that fire of, like, very simple, you know, not non-confrontational or anything like that, but still being able to say, you know what, I need this to happen. This needs to happen. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's just this needs to happen. And taking that whole ego completely out mm -hmm. of this con conversation. I think it, the first year that I worked here, I was the youngest person in the entire company. And still I had to be able to get this stuff done, work with these people all the way up to the CEO. Like I work with Todd um, on some of the things that I do right now. And because I take myself out of it, I take him out of it, and I just focus, am able to focus on the task, we're able to get it done without any of that, kind of work around that whole intimidation, any of the noise that might be around our backgrounds you know and that was a huge thing for me also um tim malfara um he's the vp uh of isg uh, which is our um delivery arm of our infrastructure side um just the way he's very open and can speak plainly about things without all of the like overthinking I guess was a really big thing that I, I think the doing. culture of the next and that is the egos are never in the room yes exactly and I think that makes it so easy for 
a partner like Hewlett Packard Enterprise mm -hmm. to work with an Exonet. We do have other partners who deal with their, you got to deal with some of the ego issues. Mm -hmm. This is not prevalent at an Exonet. And, and quite honestly, I'll give uh, Brenda kudos here. Brenda and I really don't work together often in the in the company. I think mm -hmm. the, our first time we ever really like hung out and talked a little bit was we went to someone's farewell lunch and I was yeah. like, wow, she's really interesting. But whenever I hear Brenda's name at an accident, it's usually from a man. And it's all <laughs> about her good work and her detail oriented and the multitasking. Again, yeah. what women do best. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. So we do have two people from HBE. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to talk about? Any new products or any exciting things happening? I just want to mention, give a plug that um, Patty will be attending Women in the Channel, sponsored by Hewlett Packard Enterprise, next week in New York City. Oh, wow. So um, this is something that we do annually. I think we do it twice. I think there's actually also one in the spring. I'll try to make sure and get you to that one. So that so obviously HP Enterprise does do a lot of investment in women, and that extends to our reseller group because we consider an X and N extension of our sales force. We also um, had the pleasure of attending HP um, Discover this year in Las Vegas, and they did a whole track on women in IT there as well. So HP does invest in women and shows their appreciation. And that's all the way to the top because Antonio Neri was in that. Um, yes, yeah, so that was a good session. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's commendable. Yep. As a last thing, um, from each of the different generations, what is one piece of advice you'd want to give someone thinking of or first joining the technology space? I would say the piece of advice I got, because like as I mentioned before, my background was not technology, mm -hmm. is to be yourself. It is just so much easier to work if you're just not putting on any airs or trying to pose as anything. Mm -hmm. Be yourself. Uh, if you don't understand something, as Patty mentioned, if you don't understand something, just ask somebody, what did you just say? Mm -hmm. um, and I think because I think so many people get nervous and it really doesn't do them any good to not ask the questions. That would be my advice. Just be yourself. Okay. I would agree um, with your be, be yourself, ask questions, and also speak your mind because mm -hmm. people, are, people are listening. And if they are not listening, maybe it's the right field but the wrong company. Mm -hmm. I would probably say it's, you know, work hard, work smart. And have fun. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's work. That's another so, reason like, why we call it an X and You really <laughs> just fun. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like you, you, you plug in those hours, but you have to have fun while you're doing it. You have to have fun. Um, surround yourself with great people. I work with a lot of brilliant women, obviously. <laughs> and um, other than just, like, the digital marketing skills, I really learned a lot of communication skills and, um, you know, getting in front of the right people. And Great job. Gonna need therapy after I have nothing to say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Remember that at least on some level, if, even if it's just the base level of you're all human. You know, mm -hmm. everybody that you talk to, you're you are an equal to. I guess just by remembering that in all of your interactions, it allows you. It allows me personally to both give people the res baseline of respect that I believe they deserve that allows us to work, but then also kind of takes out that intimidation so that you can focus on what you actually need to do. All right. Um, any final comments? Any final questions before we wrap up? No, this was fun. Yeah, this, this was, was fun. All right. We did it. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you, Thank Brenda. You. Thank you. Have fun. And with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you for listening to Nexonet's special uh, infrastructure podcast on women working in the